All right, so this presentation is on invasive plants. What does it mean and why should I care? I'm Brandy Pethel, Master Gardener Extension Volunteer for Jackson County, University of Georgia Extension. Uh, Got to go through this really quick. Uh, UGA Cooperative Extension offers its educational programs, assistance, and materials to all people without regard to race, ethnicity, national origin, color, sex, sexual orientation, religion, age, disability, or veteran status, and is an equal opportunity affirmative action organization. The University of Georgia Cooperative Extension is committed to providing access for people with disabilities and will provide reasonable accommodations if notified. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is go ahead and get a save the date in for the Great Georgia Pollinator Census. It'll be August 19th and 20th this year. Um, it's a really fun way, um, not only for kids, but for adults too, to kind of just take pause and realize all the, the pollinators and insects that are out there on our, our flowers and our gardens. All right, so I'm starting my talk on invasive plants with a quote. This is from E.O. Wilson. He's an American biologist, naturalist, and writer. He's known as the father of biodiversity, and he was a worldwide expert in ants. So he said, the two greatest destroyers of biodiversity are first, habitat destruction, and second, invasion by exotic species. So we're gonna go through basic definitions. What even is an invasive plant? What regulations are in place? We'll look at lots of pictures of plants. I've also included um, some native or non-invasive uh, substitutions for plants. If you have one of these native or invasive plants as a, a viable substitution. Um, what you can do if you do have native, not native, invasive plants on your property. And then um, some more resources from where basically I sourced my information. So I couldn't figure out a way to really like shorten this. So I'm just going to read this definition. This is from the Georgia Invasive Species Task Force. And its website is at the bottom, gainvasives.org. Um, a good bit of my presentation comes from uh, this group. Uh, they just have some of the best Georgia-specific information. So... Invasive species, also known as exotic, non-native, or introduced species, are plants and animals that have been introduced either intentionally or accidentally into areas outside their natural ranges. And so it's not just something that's growing somewhere outside its natural range. An invasive species has to also cause economic or environmental harm. These species are capable of having a negative effect on Georgia's economy, natural environment, and human and animal health. Um, this next paragraph is really saying an invasive species can be anything that's alive. I mean, plants, insects, diseases, mammals, it goes on and on. Anything can be an invasive species. If left uncontrolled, invasive species can and will limit land use, cause billions of dollars in economic losses, threaten the state's biodiversity, and become a financial burden to control. Because of the negative or the potential negative impacts that can result from invasive species, it's become an official public goal in Georgia to reduce the environmental and economic damage caused by harmful non-native species. So specifically on plants, it's any species, it's seed spores or any other biological material probable or capable of propagating that is not native to the ecosystem and whose introduction does or is likely to cause environmental harm. I'm gonna note that political boundaries are not really used whenever they determine a species nativity. Um, it's exotic when it's not native to a particular ecosystem. So you may have a species that's native to South Georgia, but it could be aggressive here in North Georgia or vice versa. So, um, you have to consult some maps and things whenever you're trying to determine if a plant is native to an area. To say it's native to Georgia is an assumption that it's native statewide. So whenever you're digging deep into any of this, just make sure that, you know, plants don't know boundaries. So um, regulation wise in Georgia, there's regulations against the sale of, a, of certain exotic plants but there aren't regulations against buying them or buying them at say a farmer's market or trading them or growing them. They're just not there. So um, 
as a homeowner, if you possess some kind of exotic or invasive plant, it's really just up to your, you know, moral guidelines on whether you feel like this plant is under control and not causing a problem, or if it is causing a problem, then that's kind of your cue. Okay, I, I maybe should do something about this. But I will caveat that. Sometimes you don't know that a plant is a problem because it may not be a problem right where you have it planted, but it's caused a problem elsewhere because of seed dispersion. Uh, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of lists out there. So this is the federal noxious weed list. So these plants are not allowed to be sold uh, nationwide. And so they're checking for these weeds whenever plants are imported into the United States and when they're crossing state lines and even states have more, some states have more regulations on these weeds. Um, most of these, I mean, just glancing through this list, well, these are all aquatics. So I was like, I don't even know any of these. Um, but this uh, weed list, you can just Google to find, if you're interested in finding out what um, the United States government considers a, a noxious weed. Um, the Georgia Exotic Plant Pest Council has uh, lots of plant lists. So I put their website up there. Um, a lot of the plants that I'm showing you guys today are actually from this pamphlet, which I had brought enough to pass out, and I'm so sorry that I'm not there. Um, I'll bring a couple to Elizabeth that she can have in the library that you guys can have. Um, you can also get this at the Extension Office in Jackson County if you would like. Um, but this is printed by Georgia, GeorgiaInvasives.gov, which is closely related to this Georgia Exotic Pest Council. Um, but it's got lots of pictures and things in it too, which I also have in the presentation today. Um, this is the a list of plants from the GAEPPC.org. Um, it's got your scientific name here, your common name over here. I got the pictures you guys are going to see next in this presentation. Uh, I sourced from these lists. So um, we'll just go ahead and dig in. I started with this red category one is what I called it. It's called severe or emerging threat in, um, in that GAEPPC plant list. Um, these are ones, plants that are known that they are causing current damage, economic damage to, or biological damage um, to the ecosystem. So I would assume that everyone is familiar with Chinese wisteria. It's native to China. Its cuttings were brought over in 1816 by the East India Company, which is kind of a neat piece of history. Um, it was brought to the West, it was brought to Europe, and then it was brought here, of course, with the colonies. Um, and it was grown kind of in this, you see in this picture here at Colorado State University, it was grown as a, a, a cover, a shade to put over porches and things. Um, unfortunately, uh, as you guys probably see when it, when it blooms, it gets, way out of hand, way out of control. There's, you know, purple up and down the sides of highways. Um, it, it's similar in its um, smothering that kudzu has, which we'll go, <laughs> we have that later. Um, but it, it shades out native plants. And um, with any of these, when you have native plants being suppressed, you're also affecting the native fauna uh, in the area because a lot of the plants, in, a lot of the animals are reliant on plants uh, for their food. And so they won't eat something like Chinese wisteria. Um, and if that's the only thing left in an area, then the wildlife has been pushed out. Um, but it's got really pretty flowers and it's in the pea family, as you can see by the shape of the seed. Uh, there is an American wisteria. It's a lovely little shrub, has smaller floral inflorescences, still smells amazing. Um, it just doesn't have that same vining that uh, the the wisteria, the Chinese wisteria has. Uh, so this is a, a great substitution if you're looking for that purple uh, similar cluster P inflorescence in your garden. Uh, the multiflora rose is another invasive category one severe emerging threat plant. Um, it's native to Eastern Asia, so it's China, Jap Japan, and Korea. Um, it's an ornamental, it was grown as an ornamental plant and it's also used as the rootstock for many, many, many hybrid grafted roses. So um, those of you with rose shrubs, you may 
sometimes have growths coming from that rootstock. And if it goes to flower, it may look like this. And you may wonder why have I got a weird rose on my rose shrub? So um, it happens sometimes that a rootstock sends up um, a branch. Um, it, like many of the other invasive plants, was brought in as a, a soil conservation measure, a hedge for grazing land and things like that. But it's escaped, uh, it's, excuse me, it's escaped captivity. It's escaped that ornamental um, growing. And uh, it, it just, again, it crowds out uh, native species. The, the native rose in, in the area, uh, but we do have some native roses, but they only have one or two or three flowers on each stem. Whereas you can see here in this picture, there's a cluster. So if you're seeing a cluster of roses like this, more than likely you're looking at that in the multiflora rose. This is a, a substitution that I really like. It's blooming right now. It's the double file viburnum. Um, it's a, a shrub that has that similar uh, clusters of white, but it's a little bit um, more along the branches. It's, it's just got a really pretty unique uh, floral pattern to it. So, um, so that's my suggestion. There's lots of suggestions for replace for other plants for this. Um, this is not a rose family plant, uh, but I, I think it has that similar color and kind of similar feel to it. Our favorite, right? The, the vine that ate the south, kudzu. Uh, I was really surprised when I saw kudzu close up because I thought, that just looks like a bean plant. And it is. It's, it's a member of the bean family. It's native to East Asia. And it was also introduced to um, as a soil conservation method to help stop erosion. Um, problem is, is it grows... Uh, a mile a minute, they say, and it uh, reproduces by cloning. So it will, um, everywhere a root, a node touches soil, it will send roots down. So it just con continuously clones itself. It also reproduces by seed and by rhizome. So where it will just spread underground. Uh, this one is really, really clear in what it does to the native environment. Um, you can't even hardly see a tree. You can see this tree in the center is just kind of poking out its, its leaves, but it'll be overtaken soon. It shades out its competition. So it creates such a dense canopy that basically nothing grows underneath it. Um, it also crushes structures. Uh, and you have that same reduction in wildlife that is dependent on the native trees and shrubs in the area. When kudzu's in the air, in that area and spreading, it um, obviously causes problems. And there's some um, study going on about uh, carbon dioxide as it increases in our atmosphere. Um, they're seeing kudzu is becoming even more and more aggressive in response to that increase in carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. So it gets stronger the more carbon dioxide that we um, put into the atmosphere. Um, and I'll, I don't know anyone who would intentionally plant kudzu. I, I think what I read is it was it was brought in as an ornamental to create shade, like kind of like the wisteria did in your garden. But man, that thing would take over your house probably in three or four years. And um, anyway, this is a native vine. It's called Virginia creeper. Uh, it's one of my favorite fall vines. You can see in this picture on the right. It's got beautiful fall color to it. Um, it's often mistaken for poison ivy, but poison ivy never has five leaves. Um, however, I react to Virginia creeper. It makes me very mildly itchy. It doesn't blister or anything, but I don't react to poison ivy. So honestly, in my book, Virginia creeper is more dangerous to me than, than poison ivy. Um, it does make uh, berries for birds and, and things like that. So it's a, it's a great plant for wildlife. and. Uh, it's just, it's a nice plant. It, I have some that grows up the side of my house and of course I take it down because I don't want anything that could potentially allow um, pests to get into my house, rats or bugs or anything like that. So, um, so I do keep plants off of the house, but I have some that grows up some pine trees in my backyard and I just leave it because it's really pretty, um, especially in the fall. 
This one is um, one that I learned about recently. It's called the princess tree, Polonia tomentosa. Uh, the, the ending tomentosa means uh, has hairs on it. So these, um, the leaves and I believe the seed pods have little hairs on them. It's native to central and western China. You'll pro you can see them now. Last I saw, they hadn't leafed out yet, but it looks like they have almost little tiny pears hanging from the tree, and that's the um, the seed from the tree. And those little seeds hang on all winter long until the tree leaves out again. So if you're driving around and you're like, a tree just looks like it has a bunch of little tiny pears hanging in it. That's a princess tree, Polonia tomentosa. Uh, it's native to either east, uh, excuse me, central western China. Um, it was naturalized. It's naturalized here in the eastern U.S. They're all over the place. They pop up basically on almost any disturbed soil. Um, they're also in the central U.S. and western Europe as well. Uh, they were initially spread because the seeds were lightweight and soft, and they used them as packing materials um, in exports out of China of like fine China. So these little seeds just flew out wherever wherever they were going um, in, tra in transportation, and so they're pretty much everywhere. Um, in Japan, where this tree is native, uh, when a couple has a daughter, they plant one of these trees, they plant a seed, and by the dot time the daughter is in her late teens, early 20s, ready to marry, the tree is large enough that they can fell the tree and build a tansu, which is a dresser that they use as a wedding gift. And so that's why it's called the princess tree, because it's kind of like something that grows along with your daughter um, to then be able to build your, her wedding gift out of. So it's a neat story. Um, but again, it, it's not native here. It readily reproduces by seed and um, it produces a really quick growing heavy shade tree. It's got big leaves on it. And so it's gonna crowd out the native plants underneath it. This is a fun uh, a pollinator host plant, the catapa tree. Um, this is a, an, everyone that I speak to about this tree usually says, oh, my grandpa or my aunt and uncle, they had one of these trees and we used to take the worms and we went and took them fishing. Um, but it has nice flowers just like the uh, princess tree has. And it also has that added benefit of having some um, pollinators on the tree, whether you use them for fishing worms or not. <laughs> Uh, this is a popular one and I'm sure everyone has seen or been around English ivy. It's grown as, also, as a house plant, which in that case, it's not um, a threat. Uh, it's native to most of Europe and Western Asia. Uh, the main damage here is again, shading out competition beneath it, but it also can cause structural damage. So it can damage brickwork, gutters, it can hide structural faults. If you have a wall of your home covered with English ivy and you get a crack in it, you'll never know it's there. Um, and it can harbor unwelcome guests. This is a perfect ladder for a mouse to climb to get up into your gutters or into your um, roof soffits. So uh, it's also can, it, it keeps the ground moist underneath it and it, and the, the brick would stay moist and bring in, you know, molds and things like that. Also on the side of a tree, you can have damage to a tree that then is uh, moist and wet, which is exactly what fungus is looking for. So um, it can cause damage uh, in that way too. The uh, alternative for this one is called Allegheny Spurge. It's another ground cover that doesn't, um, doesn't climb structures. It doesn't uh, grow up trees. So it doesn't exactly replace that, that niche. You know, if you want something that's gonna cover a wall or something and not be aggressive or pull the wall down, um, you could go with that uh, Virginia creeper that I showed a couple slides ago. Um, it, it will cover the wall nicely and, and give, uh, um, added texture to a wall. It is not 
uh, evergreen though, like the English ivy. So there's that trade-off there. Um, the Allegheny Spurge, I, I believe, is an evergreen. I don't, um, I don't personally have any, so I, I can't just get that right off of my experience. <laughs> Uh, this is one that any of us who have worked in natural areas are familiar with. It's Chinese privet. Um, it, it basically just looks like this, a really nondescript, shrubby, kind of lanky uh, shrub. It gets berries on it like this in the fall and has nice little blooms in the spring. The bees love it. The birds love the, the berries. Um, I was told by a entomologist, or not entomologist, excuse me, an ornithologist, a bird, um, a bird person. They said that the the berries of Chinese privet, though, is kind of like McDonald's to birds. It's got very little nutrition. They love it. They eat it like crazy, but it's really not doing anything for the birds. Um, likewise, this one. Uh, if you cut Chinese privet down and just lay it down and leave it there, it'll root and grow right from where you felled it. So uh, it's one that when you go to clear it out, you do have to do some work either digging it out or using glyphosate to um, try and kill the root as well. Even if you take the top and you burn the top, it'll sprout right back from the root. It's, uh, it's got a strong will to live. And even glyphosate, sometimes it takes repeated applications to, to actually get it to um, go ahead and die. But it was, uh, it's native to Taiwan, China, and Vietnam, and it was cultivated as a hedge plant. There's a, a Japanese privet as well that um, is planted as foundation plantings um, all, over, all over our area, I know for sure. And uh, it, it escapes as, as it makes berries and birds eat them, and it just ends up spreading all over the place. Um, this is just a nice shrub alternative to the privet. This is a black hall verburnum prunifolium. It's got a really similar uh, flower structure to it, except it's a little more of a, a ball rather than a kind of a narrow fluorescence. Um, and it's got nice fall color as well. So this is just, like I said, these are just ideas. I didn't want to tell you guys all these terrible plants and then not give you some fun plants. <laughs> this one was a surprise to me when I first learned about it several years ago, Japanese honeysuckle. This is the honeysuckle that we all know and love and we pick the flowers and we um, suck the little honey juice, the nectar out of the uh, end of the flower. Um, may not know this, but the entire rest of the plant is very poisonous uh, to eat, but the flowers are not. Uh, it's native to Eastern Asia and it's naturalized in much of North and South America. It was brought to the U.S. in the early 1900s as an ornamental plant. Um, once it's established in an area, it again, it outcompetes the native plants for both sunlight and nutrients. It spreads by seeds and rhizomes. Um, it's it just, it takes over. It's not quite as bad in taking over as kudzu is where it covers buildings and things like that. But if you have a stand of Japanese honeysuckle, you'll notice that it, um, it does continue to spread and grow. Uh, this is a native honeysuckle, Lanacera sempervirens. It's uh, lovely. It blooms at exactly the same time that the hummingbirds show up uh, here in Georgia. So um, I don't think that that's coincidental. I think that they um, the hummingbirds are following the blooms, <laughs> but um, I have one that I keep on my back porch and I watch it and I always know when the hummingbirds come because I can see when the blooms open and here they come uh, showing up to, to eat. It will spread underground just like the other honeysuckle does, but it's just not as aggressive. It's not going to um, climb up and, and pull branches down and things like that, and the leaves are not um, so dense that it's shading out everything under it. Um, this is a, an interesting one too, the mimosa plant. Um, it's a, usually grows into a tree. It was na native or is native to Southwest and Eastern Asia. It was introduced in Europe in the mid 1700s. So this is one of those really early uh, ornamental um, plants that was brought out of its native range. 
Uh, and again, it was planted as an ornamental because it is really pretty. Um, but it spreads by seeds and they're the little seed pods when they open have little um, fluffs on them so that they float in the wind. And so these seeds spread all over the place. This one, um, the, the leaves open and they close up at night and open up during the day um, or you can touch them and make them close up. So it's a fun, it's a fun plant for kids but it does crowd out those native plants that would have grown there otherwise. And so it is on the severe or emerging threat list. Um, this is just a really neat, again, it's a small tree, a shrub. Um, it's called fringe tree, Chianthus virginicus. And this is how it blooms. It blooms in this crazy mess of fringe and fluff. And then the rest of the year it uh, has um, during the growing season, it has these nice large leaves on it and it does deciduous. It loses its leaves in the fall. So now we're going to step down a category. So this is category two. These are significant threats. So these plants, and I did not go over every one of the category one um, severe threat plants. There's just too many of them. I, I didn't figure I'd want to bore you guys with plants that I don't typically see when I go to someone's home. Um, what I included here are things that I've seen in, in visits and things like that as I, as I go around. So these are significant threat. This is thorny olive, autumn olive. It's an Eliagnus. Um, it's, it's easy to spot on the road as you drive by because it has this long branch that has plants, um, leaves coming out of it. it. The leaves look really similar to me to the Buddleia plant, the butterfly bush, um, but uh, these actually have blooms on it um, in this picture over here. So it's got a little bit of a lighter tint to it, uh, but it's a uh, Asia native as well. It was introduced around 1830, again, as a landscape plant and it escapes cultivation and has just spread all over the place. Um, a non-native or a non-invasive alternative is downy serviceberry. This um, is also another tree that's blooming right now. Um, it's, it blooms along with some of the cherries and things like that. It's a uh, serviceberry. It's, it's somewhat closely related to an apple. You can see they look like little tiny, little tiny apples on there. Um, and they, just their tree structure looks very similar to a small apple tree. Um, I think you can make a jam out of the service berries. Um, I haven't, I haven't done that before, um, but it's a neat, it's a neat native plant uh, to our area. Another one that I see, and I have some of this that I need to dig up because it has started spreading around. Uh, Japanese spirea. It makes such pretty flowers and the bees love it. I just, I, I need to do better about either controlling it or putting it in a pot. We'll talk about all that stuff in a minute. It's native to Japan, Korea, or China, and it's naturalized through much of the U.S. It was introduced again as an ornamental in the late 1800s. Um, it makes me sad that that this one is uh, possibly a significant threat. It looks like I messed my spelling up there. I apologize about that. Um, a non a native or non invasive alternative would be Virginia sweet spire. Uh, it also loses its leaves just like the spirea does in the um, in the winter. I think Virginia sweet spire may have. Um, the spirea with fall color, it has gorgeous fall color, as you can see in that picture on the left. Um, the flowers are not large. They're little tiny flowers that are on a, uh, on a spike, um, but they are really, they're pretty, uh, they are pretty flowers. And uh, it's a pretty non-fussy plant. It will grow, it'll grow just about anywhere. Uh, bamboo, we're all familiar with bamboo. I don't have to get into too much detail on bamboo. I was surprised on the Georgia list that it's only considered a significant threat. Um, every bamboo forest or stand that I've seen, there's nothing else growing there, much like in these, these pictures here. But 
uh, for whatever reason, it's on the significant threat list. Um, this is running bamboo. It's native to China, was brought over again as an ornamental. Um, and it creates a really difficult to remove monoculture. So you can see here, I think there's one tree that has managed to survive in this area, but there's not any, any brush under here, which um, is a clear indication that there's a monoculture going on since everything else is, is not able to grow. Uh, it's really hard to get out. I think, I think the only way to, to fully remove a bamboo stand is to get um, a front loader and just dig it out by the soil and just throw it all away and replace the soil because you have to get every little piece of root out. Um, otherwise, it'll just root and send up another bamboo shoot. Uh, this one was hard to come up with a native alternative because there's nothing native that really does the hedging that bamboo does. Um, so I picked an emerald green arborvitae. It's a totally different class. It's an evergreen. It's not a grass like bamboo is, um, but it gets the same height. It gets the same um, hedging that you get with bamboo. So um, again, if you have a bamboo stand and you're trying to get rid of it, um, you're gonna focus your energy on get rid of it first before you think about what you're gonna replace it with because it's, um, it's gonna take quite a bit of effort and energy to, to get, get rid of it. Um, sacred bamboo, Nandina is what is, I think Nandina has become a common name for it. Um, it is this Nandina domestica, sacred bamboo is the only member of the Nandina genus. So I think just calling it Nandina has, become almost a common name to it because it's the only one in the species. Um, it is native to Eastern Asia from about the Himalayas to Japan. Um, despite its name, it is not a bamboo. Uh, it was brought to London in 1804. So this is another early plant um, in the ornamental trade. Um, the berries are extremely toxic to birds. They contain hydrogen cyanide. They would also be toxic to dogs, cats, um, small humans in large quantities, larger humans, um, animals as well. So the recommendation if you have sacred bamboo is to uh, pluck the berries. The, the branches snap really, really easily, um, but take some bags, snap the berries off so that you're not causing um, any kind of poisoning issues with animals. Uh, cedar waxwings love to get these, um, and they'll have whole flocks of cedar waxwings die if they eat too many berries in one sitting. Uh, these guys spread underground by rhizomes, and they also spread by seeds. So if a bird eats um, one or two of the berries and they get an upset stomach, but they digest it and they're fine, they um, leave their droppings and a, a nandina can plant or can come out of those droppings from seed. Um, Elizabeth is going to laugh when she sees this. I had this in this slide before even I had this conversation, okay? <laughs> um, this is my suggestion for replacing the Nandina. It's called the American Beauty Berry. Um, it is a, a nice little shrub that gets these really pretty purple berries in the winter time. It's a wonderful forage for animals, birds and animals. And um, it's just a really neat native plant to uh, come upon in the wild, especially on a, on a hike and you find these gorgeous red ba or purple berries that I don't see, I don't see many plants that have these really pretty berries. So it's one of my favorite native plants. Um, so, sorry, Elizabeth. <laughs> We had a conversation. She wanted to um, cut some down and I said, no, don't cut those down. <laughs> um, periwinkle is another that's a significant threat. So this includes both the Vinca minor and Vinca major. Um, the difference between the two is it's really, they're, they're hard to tell apart. It's like the size of the, the point of the tip of the leaf. Um, I just call them periwinkle or Vinca, um, it works. Uh, it's native to Europe and the Mediterranean. So most of the stuff that we've seen that's been uh, invasives 
are from China or Eastern Asia. So this is um, the last couple actually are um, European natives. Uh, it's commonly grown as a ground cover in cemeteries in the South. So if you find a stand of vinca in the woods as you're taking a hike or exploring a property or a friend's property, um, you may find that a stand of periwinkle may mean that there are some uh, um, graves that either the markers haven't stood up against the elements or they were unmarked graves. So I thought that was a neat a neat little thing to learn about periwinkle, but um, it, it again, you can see here is not so dense, but here where it gets full sunlight, um, it can take over and crowd out uh, an area in the forest floor. Uh, my native suggestion is creeping flocks. So um, this is a picture of it in my front flower bed and I love it because I don't have to buy mulch to put underneath it. It just, it, it's a native plant, but it does crowd out in full sun all those weeds that I don't want to grow in my flower bed. Um, but this is a, a native to the southeast plant. This one, I was surprised. I did not know that oxide daisy was a um, potentially significant threat in an invasive plant. Uh, it's native to Europe and Asia, and it was introduced to North America, Australia, and it's considered invasive in 40 countries. It spreads by rhizomes and seeds. I read one plant uh, in the course of its lifetime can produce 26,000 seeds, and some seeds can remain viable for 40 years. So this is one of those that's going to come up after you, you know, turn your soil for your uh, flower or for your um, your garden. Every time you turn the soil, you're going to get more of these if, if they ever become a problem, excuse me, in your area. Um, it's bad for agriculture because the uh, cattle do not like the taste of the oxide daisies. So if their field turns into like where this roadside looks in this picture on the left, um, the cattle are going to have less grass for grazing because they're not going to um, pick around all of the where they're going to pick around it and it's going to leave some good grass in there. Uh, the cattle that do eat a daisy or two, it, um, those that are grown for milk, um, it makes the milk taste bad. So farmers uh, try really hard to keep this oxide daisy out of their pastures. Um, it also displaces native plants. So you can see in the picture on the left on the roadside, it, um, it's pretty, but it's uh, taking the place of other native plants that might would have spread to that area. So my suggestion, if you like the daisy and you want uh, something similar is to look at that brown-eyed Susan. Um, it's a native to the area. Uh, it doesn't have that same white color, but it has a similar flower shape in the same plant family. Um, so that's brown-eyed Susan. And the last one is, it makes me chuckle because I have a, you know, acre of Bermuda grass in my, on my property because that's what grass is planted uh, in neighborhoods and things. Um, but it's actually um, an invasive plant. It's a noxious weed in some uh, states. It, uh, as we all know that have Bermuda grass, it, creeps into flower beds and is nearly impossible to keep out. It doesn't die. <laughs> There's only a few uh, herbicides that will work on it and the herbicides that do work on it will kill other plants. You know, that, that same herbicide might kill the ornamental that you're trying to grow in your landscape bed. So um, Bermuda grass is also grown as a wheat, or a wheat crop, a, a hay crop for um, forage. Uh, the, the key with Bermuda grass is if you planted it from seed, you can't, you, you can, you don't want it to go to seed because it will spread. Um, interestingly, Bermuda grass that is grown and planted as sod is a hybrid. And even though it makes the little seed heads, the seeds are not fertile. The seeds cannot um, sprout. And so um, 
if you let your Bermuda grass grow tall, thinking you're going to let it go to seed and it's going to make it fuller, it doesn't. All those seeds don't, uh, if you have sod. Now, if you planted your Bermuda grass with seed, so you bought seed and you spread it or had someone spread seed, then yes, if you um, let your Bermuda grass go to seed, it will sprout, but it also may sprout everywhere else too. So there's not really a alternative to this, not much in the South really. I mean, you could, there's some other grasses you could plant. Um, Bermuda, hybrid Bermuda grass as a sod is, it, it's, there's just no other, other grass that grows as well. Um, Zoiza does in some places. Um, it's got a similar green up time and everything, but it, it has a couple more pesticides that are not, um, not safe for it than even Bermuda does. And um, yeah, it still spreads underground by those stolons that, you know, you go to dig in a flower bed and you have to dig six inches deep to get the whole plant out. It's, um, it's an aggressive one, but it does, does make for pretty grass. Um, there's another category in the list online. Again, I didn't want to go too long on this, but um, these are minor threats. So Japanese barberry, paper mulberry, cornflower, trifoliate orange, Queen Anne's lace, that wild carrot, winter creeper, tawny daylily. Those are those orange daylilies that you might see bloom up uh, late summer. Uh, Rose of Sharon, leatherleaf mahonia, peppermint. We all know and are warned about planting peppermint in our gardens <laughs> or any of the mints. Um, they spread freely. Uh, calorie pear or Bradford pear, uh, Johnson grass, which is a, um, that's a common uh, weed found in, in lawns and things. Large leaf lantana and monkey grass, the liriope that makes the little purple flowers. Um, so those are minor threat. Those have the potential to possibly cause some economic damage, but not enough to, you know, make any list other than just keep an eye on these plants. So we have all these plants. You may have some of them in your house and you're, you may have them in your house. That's fine. Um, on your property or um, maybe at a garden that you volunteer at or something. So what can you do? So the first thing you do is kind of what we did today is know your plants, get to know which ones are invasive, uh, ones that are native. So some of them have some lookalikes. Um, try to choose some native alternatives to the non-native invasives or choose some non-native ornamentals. So I'm not a native plant purist. I have an area of my property that I like to plant natives only because I'm lazy. And if I don't care for them, I know that at least them being native, they're not going to go crazy and take over the area. I have to already keep privet, you know, out of my um, area of my backyard as it is. Uh, number three is watch out for hitchhikers. Um, anytime you go on a hike or something, you always want to check your socks and your pants legs and make sure you don't have any seeds. Um, hitching a ride home with you, um, especially if you're going on like a vacation, you're crossing state lines and moving into different ecosystems. You don't wanna bring anything with you to that ecosystem or back. Um, have a care if you share. If you're gonna share a plant, make sure that you're responsibly sharing plants. If it's something that is um, an invasive, so give some education about it and say, you wanna keep this in a pot, keep this on your deck and make sure you cut the seeds out or, or whatnot. Um, don't share things that, that we shouldn't share, I guess is all, all I'm saying. Um, use read-free seed mixes. So um, buy professionally you know, sourced seeds that are going to be checked for weed seeds. Same with soil and mulch. Um, keep an eye on new sprouts and volunteers. I'm all the time having to walk my property and yank up little tiny privet plants. It's just the only way to do it. <laughs> um, we didn't really get into aquatic plants, but take care with them. If you do have a boat or any kind of watercraft, you wanna make sure that you rinse that off at the lake or the ocean, the beach, wherever, wherever the boat dock is, um, when you're removing your vehicle from the water, because you don't wanna take any of the organisms or plants with you back home. 
Uh, you want to be careful when you're disposing of invasive plants. Um, like I said, with the Chinese privet, if you we typically burn it, we'll get um, you know find a safe time when it's okay to have a fire outside, and we'll start a fire and we'll feed the fire. Um, it can't sprout from there. But if we were to just cut it and leave it in a big pile, more than likely we would come back a month later and we would have a lot of sprouts from um, the privet where it sprouted right where it was. Uh, if you're getting rid of something like in, the, in those vine families, wisteria, uh, kudzu, English ivy, um, it's probably best to, if you can't burn it immediately, to go ahead and bag it and send it to the landfill where it can decompose. Um, if you can't part with it, so if you can't dig it up, you, it's important to you, it has some sentimental value, it's okay. Um, you need to contain it, so either put it somewhere that it can't spread out or take over your house or whatever. Um, control it, so you need to keep it cut back, take good care of it, and cage it. Also part of controlling it is um, clipping seed pods because you don't want the seeds to be able to be eaten by birds or clipping berries um, so that it spreads. And caging it is like English ivy. You can keep an English ivy plant in your house. It's perfectly fine. There's not enough sunlight in your home for it to take over. It needs that um, sunlight outside. Um, and I added number 11. So the 10 were basically the, the 10 tips that were in, on the website, but you can volunteer with permission to help remove invasive species too. A lot of our parks have friends groups. So, um, and they'll go and do um, cleanups of their, their hiking trails and things like that. And sometimes they'll do invasive species removal work days where they'll go in with chainsaws and some glyphosate and they'll chainsaw the big privet stands and um, paint, the, paint the stumps to try and suppress the growth of those uh, privets. So um, those are just some things that, that you can do um, if you have or you're thinking about purchasing, uh, sourcing a, a plant that is on that invasive list. Again, in Georgia, there's a, small, a short, shorter list of things that can't be sold, but you can buy English ivy today at Home Depot. So, um, you know, just know what you're growing it for, know your plants, know if they have a tendency to be invasive and um, just do your part to control it. So these are my resources. So um, I talked about those two websites already. The longer source is this pamphlet that I, like I said, I'll get a couple copies over to the library once we're all well here in the Pethel family. And um, there is a uh, digital copy of this that you can look at as well. So um, I sent Elizabeth a copy of this um, presentation so she can um, copy those links to you and put them on her web page. Um, there's that federal noxious weeds list and then invasive.org is another, another site. So that's basically all I have. This is my email address. I'm going to put it up here in case you guys want to write it down in case you ever have questions or you want to ask um, to verify the identity, identity, <laughs> a plant verify the identification of a plant so that you make sure that you know if a plant is invasive or maybe it's a native lookalike. Um, I'm happy to help you with that stuff. A lot of it we can do just over email, emailing back and forth. Occasionally, um, if I'm in an area, I may you know, say, hey, let me come by and take a look at something. But most of the time it's just done over, over email. So I can open it up now to any questions that you have there in the room. Elizabeth. They're all just staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of information. I know it's kind of like drinking through a fire hydrant hose. So um, the main thing I, I can say is just be responsible. I was say, just be responsible with your invasive plants. If you have one that you know, I mentioned on this list. I mean, I still have some in my on my property just because I liked them. And 
I said, oh, I've never seen this be invasive and I planted it. And then now I see it sort of creeping and spreading and I'm kind of understanding by experience. And sometimes we just need that experience to, to understand something. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to shame anybody for having an invasive plant because I have them myself. So <laughs> I just know those plants are the ones that I either need to make a plan to replace, which I have plans to pull up my Japanese spirea. Um, and I just need to make the time to get out and, and pull up all my privet and Japanese honeysuckle that I have growing in the backyard and sprouts and places here and there. It's tough when your neighbors have it in their kind of just natural area because it's going to constantly always be trying to come into my area but that's a good question okay okay um in our old house we had for 36 years at least three of those invasive plants were recommended at various times by their plant nurseries is there some education you want to do there <laughs> Okay, so the question is, um, at, at a previous property, uh, there were at least three of the invasive species that were recommended to them by plant nurseries. Are there any education um, that's going on like with nurseries and I guess the, the UGA Cooperative Extension or, any, or anything like that? Yeah, um, so my main focus is with the homeowners, so I'm not involved in any of that education, but that's what these, um, georgiainvasives.org, the website, and the, the I can't remember the, the letters of it, this one, G-A-E-P-P-C, Georgia Exotic Pest Plant Council, all of those groups, their goal is education for not only the homeowner, but for landscapers to um, educate them on plants that are invasive and plants that are those borderline invasive things. Um, like all of science, it changes as we learn more about things. So, um, 20 or 30 years ago when someone may have gone through, you know, landscape architecture school or something like that, the plants were not considered invasive, but they are today. So it's important for landscapers to get continuing ed in, um, in their field because like any science field, it changes. Um, we have chemical formulations that change that we say, you know what, this formulation was no longer safe and we've learned that it's not and we need to move on to something else. And so um, I, I don't know how to tell a homeowner to uh, shop for a landscaper other than to ask them questions and say, or say use a, as a homeowner and say, I don't want any invasive plants because this is gonna cause me more work in the long run and having to maintain these plants and control them. I would rather have native species or plants that are known not to cause, you know, issues with spread or things like that. I hope that answers. It's not a great answer because I just, I really don't know. I don't know what education's going on. It's out there, it's whether they're taking it or not. <laughs> question about the three categories um because you had you know category one through three are there any categories that that I mean I guess we as homeowners should absolutely stay away from versus just managing them I would and, and this is my this is some of my opinion I would stay away from those um severe threat ones that category one is what I called it um, the severe threat, because those are known to cause either structural harm or agricultural harm, some kind of economic harm. Um, the others, it just depends on how you feel and, and your, um, your effort that you want to put into your garden, if that makes sense. I, I tell Elizabeth this all the time. I'm a lazy gardener. I really don't like pruning and having to handle things a bunch if I don't have to. And so um, this spirea, this whole side of my house where the spirea is, I've kind of let it go and haven't really taken good care of it. And so I need to go back and reassess what I'm, what, what my goal is over there. Cause right now it's just a mess. 
Um, but I can see where the spirea has, has spread. And I know, you know, now that I know it's on that emerging threat list, it makes me go, oh, well, that explains why I've had such a hard time controlling it is because it's on this list. So that, that aids my decision personally in deciding to remove that plant. So I would, I would say know your plants, get to know what's on the list and then assess it for your garden to say, am I doing enough to control this so I'm not causing some kind of economic harm to either myself, my neighbors, my environment? Um, and if you're keeping English ivy in a pot on your deck, it's probably not gonna get out of hand as long as you know the berries are, you're, you're clipping the berries out of it if it's producing berries. It may not even produce berries in a pot because it doesn't have the, the nutrient source um, that it does out in, out in the nature. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I can't say like you can't plant these because there's no regulations on it. So it's, it's all education and experience with the plants, I suppose. I don't, I don't think there's any more questions. I want to thank you for your time and oh, yeah. for your flexibility. With the, <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I just, like I said, I, I, I just, I didn't feel like that was responsible for me to, I don't know where we caught the stomach bug, but we'll, uh, we'll try to stop it in our tracks at least. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we appreciate your time and oh, yeah. thank you very oh, much. Yeah.